delighted to have uh, our great friend, Professor Russell Foster, back on the Performance People podcast, the head of circadian neuroscience at Oxford University, author of over 300, would you believe, scientific publications, and the Sunday Times bestseller book as well, Lifetime, which talks about, very aptly, the new science of the body clock and how it can revolutionise your sleep and health. An advisor to us as well with our um, performance brand, Ainsley and Ainsley. I want to start by talking about it all being about the clock, Russell. All things come back to this central feature, which is our body clock, our internal clock. Just talk to me about why is that and why we should pay attention to it. Well, first of all, lovely to see you again, Georgie. And um, I'm delighted to talk about my favourite subject. So, (laughs) circadian rhythms. If we think about it, what our bodies have to do to work, to function, is to deliver the right stuff, in the right concentration to the right tissues and organs at the right time of day. And, and of course, this is incredibly important because the varying demands of sleep and activity are so huge, we have to completely realign our biology to respond to these different demands. And the way we do it is to have an internal clock, which essentially provides a temporal or time structure to everything we do. So in anticipation of waking up in the morning, our, our, our heart rate goes up. We release uh, cortisol, which, uh, which uh, increases the amount of um, glucose in circulation. We're preparing for activity actually while we're still asleep so that when morning comes, we can get out there and exploit the new environment, the daytime environment to its full. And of course, at the other end of the day, our core body temperature drops, which is important for sleep initiation. Our whole metabolism changes. It switches from, you know, burning calories that we've taken in to actually mobilizing the calories that we've stored so we actually can survive the night. Um, and also it realigns aspects of, of, of our biology, which include toxin clearance. So getting rid of potentially damaging substances that are built up during the day, or memory consolidation, or um, essentially the processing of, 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 of information. So what the clock does is, is give us a temporal structure to do the right thing at the right time. I'm on a steep learning curve, Russell, and you're my tutor, which is wonderful, about the circadian <laughs> rhythm and, and actually how we can optimise what we already have in our systems, which is a, a wonderful internal body clock, as you've been describing. It seems to me like this is the primer for everything. And if we can optimize it well, then that gives us a fighting chance of really good health and well-being moving forward. Absolutely. I, I've sort of made the analogy that our body is a, a bit like an orchestra. You know, you've got lots and lots of individuals, lots of musicians all playing their part. Now, unless they actually play it in time with respect to each other, then you have a cacophony and not a symphony. And it's Mm. just like that for the body. If you want to do the right thing with right time, all the various component parts have to work together. The other one of your favourite subjects, apart from the circadian rhythm, is of course light. Um, So talk to me about how light and dark and the light-dark cycle is absolutely um, optimised and central to circadian rhythm thinking. Yeah. So, so we've got this clock, which is timing us and, 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 you know, um, allowing us to do the right thing at the right time. But unless it's set to the external world, then it's no use whatsoever. And the key feature of the environment, it's not the only one, but it's the key feature of the environment is exposure to the light dark cycle. That sets the internal clock, um, a master clock actually within the brain called the suprachiasmatic nuclei or the SCN, which then coordinates the rhythmic activity of billions and billions of cellular clocks throughout the organ systems of the body. And so light allows the master clock to be properly regulated, which in turn regulates the rest of the body. And without it, you have just a slide into a mess. Again, it's back to our orchestra where everything's playing at a slightly different time. And it's a it's a biological cacophony, not a symphony. So modern life is effectively, we use this in our, in our brand phraseology, but flatlining our body clock because you've got all these external sources, you've got night shifts, you've got many different things that play um, not rightly to the tune of the orchestra and can be really disruptive, can't they, in the process? Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, we've got 
some very clear examples of what happens to night shift workers. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the long-term health consequences are really quite severe. This is not trivial. And I think so many people think that, oh, well, it's just feeling tired at an inconvenient time. Yeah. No, no, no. There are big emotional, cognitive and physiological responses if we don't get it right. What about the role of sleep in all of this? Because we, you know, like you've just said about night shift workers, you know, that people just poo poo the sleep thing and, and, and make it not the priority that it should be. But actually, yeah. like, how fundamental is that? How fundamental is the role of sleep in, in the circadian rhythm piece entirely? Well, well, good sleep defines our ability to function during the day. Um, and of course, at, to what we do in the day can also feed back and, 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 and uh, influence the type of sleep that we get. It is, it's sort of yin and yang. It is essential. And I think that over the past 20 years, 10 years in particular, we've realized that sleep isn't something that we need to sort of wrestle in, into submission, uh, but, but, uh, and then sort of beat the hell out of it. It's something that we should snuggle up to. I mean, it's like some sort of, little pet fluffy animal that we should embrace um, and love. Uh, and I think so many of us feel that it's, uh, it's almost like a disease in need of a cure. And it's not. It's an essential part of our biology. And really since industrialization, we've increasingly marginalized it. Um, I think uh, Thomas Edison said, you know, sleep is a criminal waste of time and a throwback to our cave days. Um, and he got it. He was a genius in many ways, but he got that completely wrong. Whereas Pre-industrial uh, times, uh, Shakespeare, the he heavenly heavy, uh, what's it called? The, the heavenly honeydew of slumber. Um, and it's just so beautiful. People intuitively realize the value of sleep. Well, sleep, sleep, nature's soft nurse. How have I forsaken thee? Um, and, and so we've got to reconnect with sleep and regard it as a, as I say, this wonderful, cuddly friend. And why are we starting to do that now? I mean, you know, you, you must have seen it in, in so many interesting ways, you know, become fashionable and go out of fashion, but it's definitely sleep now is back in fashion. Why do you think that is? It's very, very kind that you've implied that I've been around a very long time, Georgie. <laughs> Well, you well, tried to do this interview in black and white, in fairness. <laughs> um, yes, I have seen huge changes. And, you know, I was thrilled. Um, uh, Virgin Media put out a report recently that um, people have been going, they've been getting up at about the same time, turning their, their mobiles on uh, at, at the same time, but they've been going to bed about 20 minutes earlier than they they have been, you know, five years ago. I think these are signs that people are taking their sleep more seriously. But, you know, I go back to the 80s before you were born, Georgie. Um, Not quite. And, but, <laughs> and people come in and say, oh, well, yeah, I know, did another all-nighter. And they say, oh, yeah, well done, great, fantastic. And in fact, now we realize that you don't want people in the workplace who are tired. Mm -hmm. They lack empathy. They are more anxious. They do stupid and unreflective things. Um, Productivity goes down. Well, it does. I mean, and that's what's, so, and you know, it's, it's so fascinating because the really interesting data has shown that the tired brain remembers negative experiences, but it forgets the positive ones. So, you know, if you're going around tired, then your whole worldview, your creativity, your productivity is completely biased by your remembrance of negative experiences. So yeah, it's, it's, it's changed. And I think the science has been great. It's driven it forward. Uh, there are slight problems in the sense that there have been irresponsible statements, such as if you don't get eight hours, you sleep, you're going to die. Um, and this is, this is wrong. I mean, sleep is very much like shoe size. Uh, it would be crazy to put everybody in the, in the same shoe size. And it's the same with sleep. Perfectly healthy sleep can range from six hours to, in some cases, 10 or 11 hours. Um, and, and it's all about finding out what works best for us and then sticking to that schedule. And I think, I think we've gone now a little bit too far and so many people are getting anxious. There is a condition called sleep anxiety. People are so anxious about not getting to sleep. They don't. Um, and if they wake up in the middle of the night, they think, Oh my God, that's it. I might as well start drinking coffee and doing emails. And, and it's not like that. Um, uh, we can get back to sleep and, and sleep is a very dynamic, flexible, changeable behavior. And don't sort of take you know, notice to the, the, the sergeant majors of sleep screaming that you shouldn't do this or you should do that. You can work it out for yourself. It's very variable. 
So, I mean, I, this is a horrible pun, but to say people are waking up to sleep is is clearly what's going on. But in terms yep. of the in terms of the circadian rhythm piece, are they taking it that one step further? Or is that why they're waking up to sleep? Because they're understanding actually the the ramifications of not getting the right quality sleep. Yeah, I think I think what we've got, yeah, and I think you're you're absolutely right, uh, Georgie, um, is, is that people are realizing that sleep is really important, but but. But there's more than one way to get the, the sleep that each of us needs. And that hasn't, you know, quite got through yet. It will. And people will take ownership of their sleep. I think people, many people think that sleep is what you get. But actually, there's, there's a lot we can do about improving our sleep if we're not getting the sleep that we, that we feel we, we need. You always mention that, it, you know, sleep is like shoe size and one size doesn't fit all. But the stages of sleep are universal. Mm. Um, just talk me through what those stages are over the course of a cycle and why, and why proper deep sleep at the right times is really important. Yeah, so we can briefly divide sleep into non-rapid eye movement sleep, non-REM, and REM, rapid eye movement sleep. And so we go down from a quiet resting state into three, used to be four stages, into deep slow wave sleep. And then we bounce very rapidly into rapid eye movement, REM sleep. And we go through that non-REM REM cycle, depending upon how old we are and who we are, every, let's say, 70 to 90 minutes or so. And those different stages are associated with different things. So you're quite right. That deep sleep, stage three non-REM sleep, is where we think we do a lot of um, memory consolidation and the processing of information. Um, and we got very clear data um, in the field now of how important that deep sleep is. And then you, as I said, bounce rapidly into REM sleep. And REM sleep is associated with um, maybe resolving emotional problems and issues. And so what you have is during the first half of the sleep, sleep episode, you tend to have more non-REM deep sleep. And then as you go through the night, you tend to get less deep sleep and more REM sleep. And we naturally wake from REM sleep. Now, REM sleep is where we have our most complicated and vivid dreams. And as I said, it's where we seem to unravel some stress, our stress and our anxiety. Very interesting study uh, undertaken from the citizens of New York after the Twin Towers were attacked. And the dreams were anxiety dreams, but they weren't of planes crashing into skyscrapers. That would have, that didn't occur. It was essentially being overwhelmed by a tsunami or being mugged. It was those sorts of things. And I think it's, and you know, people will, will often wake because we wake from REM sleep and they'll have these rather weird dreams. I had a dream last night about meeting Donald Trump. <laughs> um, bizarre. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I did get back to sleep again. Uh, and, um, Sorry. <laughs> and aside. <laughs> and, and aside, yeah. Um, and, and so I think those are important stages. Um, but, but really, we're, we're still pushing our way forward to, to fully understand what's going on. Um, in these different stages of sleep. And that's why it's an exciting time because we've got now lots of neuroscientists, people working on the brain. Um, <clears throat> who are coming into the field to try and tease apart these complicated different brain states and exactly what's going on. Um, so no, it's, it's, a, it's a great time. I feel like it's a really unfair question to ask of you because um, there's probably lots of different facets to this. But if you had to pinpoint the single most important thing we can take away about our body clock, what would it be from this conversation? Well, for our body clock, I think it's, it's providing a time structure for essentially um, optimizing our biology and therefore our health. Absolutely. Okay, that is what I'm now taking away from this conversation. Thank you, Russell. <laughs> Great pleasure, Georgie.